Okay, I do, the book shows axial, skeleton, appendicular, then I, I do it the other way around. I do appendicular, then axial. Because I like the, the bone markings on the appendicular skeleton, it's easier to learn bone markings there than I think the axial skeleton. So when you learn the bone, it's not just that you're gonna say, well this is the, the scapula, we call it the shoulder blade at the end. There are actually special structures on it that are identifying or locating structures to hold things like muscles or attach other bones like ligaments or tendons to. So it's not just saying, hey, this is the scapula, you have to know different parts of it. Like you have to know this is the spine of the scapula. Or this is infraspinous process. What, what do you think infra is referring to? If I have a supra <coughs> and infra, what do you think those would be referring to? One's above and one's below something, right? And then if I tell you that this thing was called the spinous or spine, spinous process, if I tell you this is a spine and it says infraspinous, where would you be looking? Infra. It sounds like inferior, so it's below. And a fossa is just a basin or a little groove. So it's telling you look for a little groove below the spine. A lot of the markings tell you exactly where things are. So bumps, grooves, holes, they're all names for <coughs> markings. Let me open this up. Okay, so we'll talk about things like projections, depressions. When, we ha when you hear the term process, it means something's poking out. So it's sticking out or projection. And there are different terms for processes. There are also different terms for depressions or dips or holes that are going into it. So first we'll go through the depressions. And the first one's a meatus. And a meatus means it's a tube-like structure. So if you hear about the acoustic meatus or the auditory meatus, where would you predict it would be auditory or acoustic? Those refer to sound, right? So where would you predict on the body you would look for something to sound? Here. So you see the little tube, this is where the ear would be. It's called the acoustic meatus or auditory meatus. It's a little tube, the ear canal. A fossa I just mentioned is like a basin-like structure. If you take your hand just slightly curve it, it creates a basin. So fossas are little grooves like that. I grab the box over. I'm gonna pass some of these bones around. Just be careful with them because they're actually real bones. So they have a tendency to break since they're so dry. So, in, I thought it was in this example. It is. So a fossa, you can see like right here where the shoulder comes together, there's a little tiny groove or it's a fossa. You take your thumb and the thumb, it's almost perfectly in there. It's a little tiny groove. It's the same thing when you're looking inside this. It's a basin-like structure, it's almost like cupping your hand. So we refer to this as a fossa. And you can see, even with the scapula, the shoulder blade, it's so thin right now that it breaks. So be careful when you're touching it. Bones are a lot more durable when they're fresh, but who knows how long this person has <coughs> been dead. So a little dry. And then there's the picture you can see. Look at this. Okay. Next is a fissure and it's a slit. So in the skull, you're going to see lots of little tiny fissures. So that's for things like nerves or blood vessels to go through. Pass that off. Same thing, don't play with the teeth because they can fall out. The teeth are just held in by wet ligaments, and the drier they get, the more the teeth are going to want to fall out. Sinuses or cavities or air pockets. That one's not sliced. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Another one, also real. But here you can see inside the bone, little tiny cavities, pockets. The ones in the front of the face are there to lighten the, the face up. And also to give basically sound resonance when you speak. <coughs> Sinuses are air filled cavities, huh? And pass it around. The next one's a foramen, and a foramen means a hole. So at the base of the skull, oh, I think I passed my last skull around. Another loose 
school. This one's fake. But big hole, you can see the big hole in the bottom. Magnum foramen or foramen magnum is telling you it's a big hole. So when you're looking for something that's a big hole, that's an obvious one that stands right out. And this is a little heavier. It's plastic. And frame is going to pop up a lot, so it's a word you should definitely get used to. All right. The next term, sulcus, grooves, and furrows, they're all little depressions. So even when we refer not just to the bones, but when we look at something like the brain, a sulcus is a groove. So you see all these little grooves, they're called a sulcus or sulci, plural. And I think Fisher is next, and no, sure isn't. So another word you might want to write, I think, did we just say Fisher? There it is. So say a Fisher is also a groove. But. Um, and again with the names, you have a sulcus, and you have one that's called the bicipital sulcus that sits on the arm. So guess what lines up inside that groove? Part of the what muscle? The biceps. So sometimes if you <coughs> if you're struggling for a word on a test, look at where the thing is, describe where it's at using the Latin terms, the descriptive terms, and a lot of times you can almost BS your way through a test. So here we have the humerus, the head of the humerus up here that sticks into the joint. And then just over it you see that little bicipital sul sulcus. It's a groove. So that the tendon of the biceps can slide right across this and keep it lined up. Right, projections, things that pop out. So the humerus is floating around. There's a femur. And condyles are large, rounded projections. So like, for instance, on the femur down here at the very end, you can see where it forms the knee. You have these two large, round, smooth condyles for pivoting on the tibia. So on the lower leg, it's like this. So you lock together and you pivot at the condyle. There's a term epicondyle, and usually when you see something that's epi, it's right above something else. So the condyles are here, the epicondyles would be up above it. This is the structure. And not just at the joint, at the knee. Mm -hmm. The jaw must be floating around somewhere too. But where the jaw meets, here's the mandible, the jawbone. Where it meets the skull, has a little rounded groove up here that fits right in place. <coughs> so it fits right in place and it pivots sliding back. Not a real school, so it doesn't line up perfectly. There you go. <laughs> Put a little spit on it and tuck it back in. <laughs> Just lick it, get it wet, and stick it up there. Probably because there are witnesses all the way around her that saw it happen. <laughs> Next structure is the heads. And heads actually look like that, like a head. Imagine a bald head right up here. So like on the humerus that I think we just, well, here's another one. Oh, this is a fake one. You get that round head on the femur, round head. In fact, when you look at the two bones, they're very similar. One's in the arm, one's in the leg. This one's real? That one's real. The femur is real. The arm is not. It's sticky as the plastic and stuff's all sticky. The bone will absorb anything sticky.
Next term is a facet, and the facet you see on the vertebra. So as we talk about each of the vertebra, where the vertebra meets the second one, and it's a pivotal point, it's called the facet. You see these little slots all the way down along here. And you have them on each side going down along. <coughs> so that when one bends, it just slides along that facet. Here you can see one vertebra, and there's where it attaches. Right. A ramus is an arm-like structure. So when you're looking at the hip, <coughs> you have different parts of the hip. You have the ischium, the backbone here. So if you put your hand around this arm-like structure, it's called the ischial ramus. You have the same thing in the jaw. The ramus of the mandible is the part that you can put your finger around and hold on to. Arm-like structure. Crest or a line. If you feel if the tibia is floating around there, I think one's floating around, there's a humerus floating around there. But if you kind of close your eyes and spin, you can feel there's a, a bold line or a crest that goes right along the front of it. You can do the same thing with the radius and the ulna. So the radius and the arm. This is the fibula or the leg. So you kind of close your eyes and feel around, you can feel the lines and the crest that go down the front. In fact, you can feel it in your leg. If you bring your hand over your knee and feel down the front of your leg, you can feel that crest that goes all the way along the front of the tibia. You can see right here on this bone. You feel it really firm. And then I, I mentioned epicondyle earlier. So this rounded part is the condyle. The epicondyle, oops, the arrow should be pointing just a little bit higher. Right. Tubercles, tuberosities, and trochanters, they're just named that based on size. So tubercles are small bumps. If the humerus is floating around there somewhere still. No. When I pointed out the bicipital sulcus before, here you can actually see the tendon going through the bicipital sulcus, the little bumps to the side. Those are tubercles. A tuberosity is a little bit bigger. So here's the front of your leg. If you feel your knee again, that first bump you feel, it's right here, it's called the tibial tuberosity. A little triangular bump. It's bigger when you have a femur. And the last one, the trochanter, you only find in the femur, in the leg. Must be floating around. But the trochanter you can actually feel through your own body. If you take your hand and you put it at your hip and then you pivot your leg a little bit, that piece of bone that moves is the greater trochanter in your femur. The tubercles are smaller, tuberosities are more, lar more larger, and trochanters are only found in the femur. Spines? Spines are very blatant projections. They usually have a point to them, like this. Here's a spine on a scapula. Here's a spine on a vertebra. Each of these are a spine of the vertebra. So they call them spines processes. So they have very bold projections. And there's just a list of the different terms. Projections and depressions. So those are kind of like when we we're trying using anatomical terms for locating things, same idea. You're using those as locators. <coughs> okay, so appendicular skeleton, those are the appendages, the arms and the legs. The two girdles are the attachment points. You have the pelvic girdle, which is known as the hip, and you have the uh, pectoral girdle, which is also the shoulder. Oops, I just jumped the gun and said those. So when you look at the arms and the legs, they're very similar. What's going to be one thing you notice that's different about the legs and the arms? Look at the size. Why would they be different like this? Yeah. And the legs are going to be more dense because they have more weight and the arms not so much. They need to be flexible so they can move around, be mobile, and pick things up and maneuver. Right. So the first one, the pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle is the scapula and the clavicle. The two attachment points to the body. One of the interesting things is if you notice, they have to put bolts in the scapula to hold it on because your scapula is actually just free floating in there. It's just attached by muscles. There's no direct attachment. 
to the axial skeleton of the scapula. The scapula attaches to the clavicle. The clavicle comes along and attaches to the center of your body. So your shoulder blade is actually free, actually free floating. If you uh, have a significant other or a friend that wants to volunteer, if you put them on the face down on the floor and you bring their arm back, you can actually slide your hand underneath their scapula and into the muscle. You should be able to. So you should be able to take your hands and wiggle them through and get them way in there. And you can do the same thing under the armpit if they feel comfortable with it. You can come up under the armpit and you can almost feel your fingers. So as you're wiggling along, you can feel one finger moving through the muscle of the other one. So the pectoral girdle, two bones, clavicle and scapula. We'll talk about the scapula first because the scapula is great for using those anatomical terms. It has a lot of them. And here you can see the scapula, the shoulder blade, and there's the clavicle attachment that comes all the way up to the sternum. Oops, sorry, I thought we had the scapula first, but I guess it's the clavicles. We have two clavicles. Um, well, it's like this guy only has one time. So we pass along. And the clavicles really only have two significant landmarks that you need to be familiar with. One, you have the acromial end, and the acromial end is significant because it attaches to an area called the acromion process. So the acromial end is way up here. <coughs> the acromion process sits on the scapula itself. So the clavicle's attachment point to the scapula is the acromion. And then the other end is called the sternal end. Why do you think they call it the sternal end? Because it attaches to your sternum. So which one would be medial? The sternal or the acromial? The sternal. And then the acromial will be the lateral. And that's really the only signif two significant structures. Scapula. A little more significant. Well, they're all important. Can't really function much without either of them. But where it sits, if you look at the location on the back, it's normally in resting position sits between the second and the seventh rib. So here's the first rib up here. You can see it sits just about the level of the second. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. To the level. Okay. There are three borders. So when you're describing it, it's a triangle. You have a superior, a medial, and a lateral border. And the borders are the edges. So where would you predict the superior would be on this thing? Here, yeah, hold on. Here's the border. Here's a border. And here's a border. Which one would be the superior one? Yep, all the way at the top. The next thing you need to do, do is if you're, this bone is laying on a table, you have to identify it. You need to figure out where it sits in the body. If this is the arm that attaches here, would this be the medial or lateral side? It would be the lateral, right? Because the shoulder blade sits right here. The arm sits over here at the very far lateral edge. So this would be the lateral border and the opposite one, the medial border. Now you've labeled all three borders right away. What was this thing called that projects out? So when you're looking at it again, you're looking at it from this perspective because you can't see the spine. When you look at the bone, always try and figure out where it is. Another way to know that this is the front side, what's the term for the front side? Anterior. Even though this thing is stuck to the back, the part that faces forward is the anterior side, this is the posterior. When this sits on the shoulder itself, the nice smooth anterior side is smooth because it slides across the ribs. It doesn't catch, it doesn't stick. If this were the other way around, the spine would catch on every single rib going up and down, like a ratchet. So if you look at a bone, you have to be able to identify what the front versus the back is. So what's the anterior side and the posterior side? Which side is lateral? Which one's medial? So looking at it like this, here again you can see there's a superior border, there's the lateral that's on the same side the arm would be on, and there's the medial that would be on the side of the vertebra. When they refer to the angles, they're talking about the points, the superior angle and the inferior angle. These three processes you have to know. Have to, have to. So the first is that little dip or groove, and they call it the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa. 
and that's where the humor sits. The next one is the coracoid process, and it's an attachment point for muscles, ligaments, and tendons. And the last one is the acromion process. And it's all the way at the very end of the spine. The glenoid fossa, glenocavity, the coracoid process, and the acromion process. If you flip around, now you're looking at this side where you see the spine. You can locate under the spine, which we refer to the infraspinatus region. And above it would be the what? This is infraspinatus. This must be something about superior, so it's called superior. <coughs> These are both little grooves or, or basins that hold muscles. So we call them fossas. You have two of them. And if you get used to using the different terms, when we label the muscles that go through here, they're usually named after the region that you're sitting next to. So I think we've labeled everything. Infraspinous fossa, supraspinous fossa, there's the spine, and there's a the chromium. Looking at it from the lateral aspect, is looking straight into where the arm would sit. Here you see the glenoid fossa. Here the acromion that sits up on the spine. And the coracoid process. Now the upper limb. So going through the arm, 30 bones to name each of them. So once you've gotten these 30 down, you know the other one's exactly the same. When we group them, we group them into the arm, which is what? What's the B word for the arm? Brachial. Yep. So the brachial or brachial region. And what was the forearm? The antebrachium. So when we ask about the arm, remember that's the upper part of what we traditionally call the arm. The lower part of the forearm is the antebrachium. So the bone in the arm is called the humerus. It's the only bone in the arm. And again, remember the arm term is referring to the brachial region. When you look at its connecting points, the head of the humerus articulates. What's articulate mean? Forms a joint. When you hear articular anything, it's referring to joints. Articular cartilage is the cartilage in the joints. And articulation is the joint. So the humerus articulates up here at the scapula with what's that little fossa or basin that I was talking about I kept pointing to over and over again. Clap goes passed around, but so here's the humerus. Here you have the head of the humerus, it's the bald head. What do you usually find below a head? A neck. So that little ring here is referred to as the neck. So the head of the humerus and the anatomical neck of the humerus. Here's that groove where the biceps set. So it's a sulcus. What do they call that sulcus? Where the biceps sat. It's called bicipital. Again, if you don't remember the name, shoot from the hip. If it's where the bicep sits, then put biceps on one of the name. If it's a small groove like that, it's called a sulcus. There's a bump, so there's the sulcus. You have a big bump on the top and a smaller bump on the bottom. They're called tubercles because they're not gigantic bumps. They're both tubercles. But you have the greater, which is talking about height and lesser, not necessarily the size. So don't get stumped when it says greater, like it's bigger or lesser. It's just greater means it's a little bit above. And the intertubercular sulcus is telling you it's in between the tubercles. Inter means between, if you ever see that. Like an interstate goes between states. An intrastate stays within the state. Like Interstate 30, which was originally Lincoln Highway, just stays in Iowa. Intrastate. Interstate 80 goes across Iowa and into Illinois and Indiana and Ohio goes between the states. So inter means between two things. Intra means within. Don't mix those two words up. They'll get you. There's a little bump here. It's a tuberosity. 
So as I look down, here's the bicep, and a little over to the edge, I have this little pointy bump called the tuberosity, and it's called the deltoid tuberosity. Guess why? Guess what attaches here? Deltoid. Yeah, the deltoid. The deltoid is a group of muscles right here on the outer edge of the arm. They come down and they attach at that point. So if you're looking at the arm like this, you have the attachments come down and attach right here. You're ever playing with the skeleton or looking at the skeleton, these red and blue markers are all attachment points. So the deltoid would come over here and attach to the tuberosity. Going all the way down to the bottom, you have condyles. Condyles are those rounded projections, and there are two of them. And one is really round and smooth, and the other one's kind <coughs> of jagged. Here's how I remember this. One that's rounded and one that comes in more of a point. The one that's rounded is the capitulum. So a couple ways you can think of this. The capitulum kind of looks like the letter C. And then the trochlea is the one that's more jagged or pointy. Sometimes I think maybe I overthink about things, but my first degree in school was psychology, and I love some of the fun things, the way our brain thinks. And when I was learning this, I thought, well, that, that makes perfect sense. The capitulum is kind of round and smooth, and the is jagged, because there was this psych study where they, they said, well, we found two islands out in the Mediterranean. We have one that looks kind of like that, and we have another one that looks like this. One of the islands they called Malumu, and the other one they called Katiki. How many people think, which one do you think they named Malumu? Island A or B? Does anybody think A? Right. How many people think that they named Katiki A, or A Katiki? Yeah, people just automatically do that. We associate sounds and words to shapes. So the capitulum is kind of nice and rounded to see. The trochlea is jagged and it's kind of a sharp word. So I just remember it that way. Whatever stupid little things you can do to remember names or locations or whatever, do it. That worked for me. Maybe it works for you. If it doesn't, find your own way to do it. If you don't want to do it my way, find your own way. But anyway, you can see the rounded capitulum and then there's the trochlea. Right. And they're both condyles, they're both pivot points. That's where they form what joint? Yep, the elbow. And then you have a couple fossas here. So a fossa, remember, is a little groove. You have the radial fossa. Guess what bone is going to slide into the radial fossa? Anybody know your bones? the radius. And they have another one called the coronary fossa, and I just wish they would have called it the ulnar fossa, but they didn't. But should I just pass away my bones? I did. I got another one here. So when you're looking at it, here's the radius. As the radius pivots up, it actually slides right between that radial fossa. Here you see the, the ulna, it's more jagged and pointed, but it falls there. On the back of the arm, there's another fossa or groove. <coughs> this one's called the electrodon fossa. As you pivot back here, it's locked into place. This is called the electrodon process. So the electrodon process actually sits on the ulna, pivots into the electrodon fossa. So three holes. And when the forearm pivots, it can lock into all three of those holes. The electronom process on the back, and then the raise and the ulna on the front. I think we covered um, the condyles and then the epicondyle. The term epicondyle just means it sits above the condyles. The epicondyles on the humerus are actually kind of significant because disorders like golfer's elbow or little league elbow are when the tendons that attach to these epicondyles become very sensitive. 
So if you feel all the way down the humerus, where it starts bulging out, right at that first bulge, those are the epicondyles. And if you squeeze on them, they're kind of tender. If you tighten up your arms and your forearm, you can feel the muscles pulling on those tendons too. So the epicondyles are actually significant. Here's another important thing. One's called the lateral epicondyle, and the other one's called the medial epicondyle. So you need to be able to locate which one's which. There are a few ways to do it. One way to do it is I always think of the head. Does the head sit on the lateral or the medial side of the humerus? The medial side. So if I follow the head all the way down to this epicondyle, which one am I looking at? The medial epicondyle and the opposite would be the lateral. If I'm looking at the arm bones and with one arm like this, the radius that we're going to talk about next bone we'll talk about, the radius sits on the lateral aspect and the ulna sits on the medial aspect. So remember anatomical position being like this. The radius sits over here by the lateral and the ulna by the medial. You have to be able to identify which is which, medial versus lateral epicondyle. I think we just named everything on here. Here's a close-up of the elbow joint. So here you can see those two fossas again. The coronary fossa, there's the ulna, and as you pivot it back, it slides right into that fossa. Here's the radius, as you pivot it back, it falls into the radial fossa. If you turn the arm around, there's the electronic process. You can feel the electronic process, that pointy thing on your elbow. As it slides back, it locks right into that fossa. Go forward, you can feel it. You slide it back, it locks right into the fossa. Forearm. Two bones. You have the radius and the ulna. There's a special structure. It's a connective tissue that's in between. <coughs> between again. Osseous means what? Bone. It's telling you it's a, a membrane that's between the bones. So it looks like this. You see that webbing that goes all the way through. It helps support the two bones and hold and guide them into place. So the first one, the ulna. The ulna, and this is important to notice, the ulna is actually what contributes to the movement of the elbow, not the radius. If you look at the ulna, here it is. You only have something that looks like an ice cream scoop on the end. That's the electronic process. I'll pass this right and use this as an example. If you were to pull the radius completely off, you can see that the actual bone that makes the joint would be the ulna, where it attaches to the humerus. That's what does the pivoting back and forth. There's the electronic process as it straightens out, it goes into the electronic fossa of the humerus, and it locks into place. So this is the bone that makes the biggest contribution to the elbow, movement of the elbow. And you'll find the radius is just the opposite. When you get to the wrist, it's the radius that does most of the movement. <coughs> the ulna stays really fixed. It doesn't spin. If I hold the ulna in place, I can still move the hand a lot. So there's the ulna. There's the electronic process that you have to know. There's from the back, the posterior perspective. As you go all the way down, you can see the interosseous membrane holds two together. At the very ends, you have two joints. You have the radial ul ulnar joint here and a radial ulnar joint here. They call it radial ulnar because it attaches those two points and it lets them move back and forth. It's not an extremely mobile joint, but it's an attachment point. So on the ulna, you have the radial notch. And on the radius, you'll have the ulnar notch where they, the two of them attach. This is kind of cool too. If you look at the end of the radius, the radius is the bone that has the round end. So the ulna not, or the radial notch of the ulna, this thing is pivoting almost perfectly. So on the top it spins around the humerus and over on the ulna it spins sideways so that your radius can pivot and rotate back and forth. The only other significance where you have a head at the very top, uh, the bumps. Styloid processes are the little bumps you can feel on both sides here. So they help form the wrist. One side, the styloid process of the radius, of course, on the radius side, and then you have the same thing over on the ulnar side. 
but you can put your fingers on them and you can feel them when you're pivoting. So I think that's now all the ones you have to know. Interosseous membrane, radial ulnar joint. There's the head of the radius. What's always below a head? A neck. Yeah. And then the styloid process on the ends. There's the electronic process. They said kind of like a little ice cream scoop. The trochlear notch is where it pivots on the trochlea itself. The coronoid process goes into the coronoid fossa. They all line up. So if you remember all those structures on the humerus, all the same structures or the opposing structures, I guess, would be on the ulna. Yeah. And then the radius, the radius pivots on the capitulum. So here's where the radius sits. Now you said before, the radius has a special design. The head of the radius has a really nice curve to it, almost perfectly round. It pivots on the capitulum, but it can also spin or rotate. So when you look at the ulna, the ulna has a special notch, perfect for that radius to spin in it, just like this. There's the capitulum, there's the head of the radius, the pivots, really nice. There's the ulna, and that little radial notch, and it spins, really nice. So when you look at the radius, the first identifying characteristic for me on a radius is I look for the radial head, look how round it is. It spins really easy. So it'll pivot, it'll spin, it'll rotate. the capitulum again, there's the head of the radius, and then you see the radial notch in the ulna, designed perfectly for rotation and spinning. And the last structure, hand. So the different parts of the hand, the carpus is the wrist, the metacarpals and the phalanges. So the <coughs> carpal region, when you have carpal tunnel surgery, they go and they slice here and they would do the work. Across the palm are called the metacarpals, and the fingers themselves are called the phalanges. Three main regions. <coughs> and then the carpal bones, there are eight of them, and I thought, yeah, here it is. There's a mnemonic that the book gives you. It says, Sally left the party to take Carmen home. It's telling you the first letter of each of these is, is naming each of the bones. So if you're in anatomical position, you're looking at the proximal row, which would be the closest to the elbow. From the lateral, what would be lateral? On the pinky or the thumb side? The thumb side, yeah. So going proximal all the way up here and lateral, and then starting over with the next row, distal lateral, and coming over. It's like this. Oh, here's another thing you need to do. When you see just a skeleton hand like this, you need to figure out whether you're looking at the front or the back. It's kind of hard to do when you look at the fingers or if you look at the radius and the ulna. So here's how you do it. There are eight bones in the wrist, but you can only see eight bones from the anterior side. That's it. So if you look over here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That means you have to be looking for the, at the front. If you look over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you're missing one. One little bone right here sits only at the front, and you can't see it from the back. It's called the pisiform or pisiform. It's a little tiny bone here. So if you take your hand and you were to grind into something, it's the pisiform that would actually do the pushing and the force. It's only on the front side. Okay. So you have the scaphoid is the first one, and that sits all the way proximal and lateral. So scaphoid, the lunate the triquetrium, and then the pisiform sits right above it. If you go to the next level and start over again, you have the trapezium, which is a significant one because it pivots with the thumb, has a special shape for pivoting with the thumb. The trapezoid, and you can see they don't perfectly line up with every finger, but the trapezoid goes with the pointer finger. The capitate is the next one, and then the hamate. So four across here, four across here. 
And when you're looking at the front, that's the only time you see all eight of them. When you're naming the metacarpals across the palm, you name them starting with the thumb as the first. So one, two, three, four, five. A little kinky to wax. This isn't in bold, but it should be. The thumb's other name is the pollux. When we get to the big toe, it's the hallux. But it's the pollux. So when you're looking at muscles that are referring to moving the thumb, the, a lot of times they'll have the term pollux in the name. And then I already mentioned this is number one through five. Same with the fingers, they're num number one through five. So as we're listening across here, are we looking at the front or the back of the hand, anterior or the posterior area? <coughs> Do you remember the name of the little tiny bone that you could only see from the front? It's called the pisiform, and there it is. So are you looking at the front or the back of the hand? You've got to be looking at the front, because you can see all eight of the bones across the carpal region, including the pisiform. So we're looking at the front of the hand. So which hand are you looking at? If you're looking at the front of the hand, the thumb is over here. You're looking at your right. So it's like this. So number one, the thumb, two, three, four, five. These are the metacarpals and then the phalanges. The phalanges, you have 14 of them, which seems really weird, because how many fingers do you have? Or how many digits do you have? You have five, right? So that's, that means that all of them have three phalanges in them, three little bones, except the thumb only has two. When you're naming these, you name them by location. So the proximal ones are the ones that sit closest to the palm. The distal sit the furthest away, and then there's no clever name for the middle one. It's just the middle. So you have a proximal phalange 5, a middle phalange 5, and a distal phalange 5. Proximal 4, middle 4, distal 4. Just keep doing that. But with the thumb, you only have a proximal and distal. There's no middle. And you can flip it over. And when you flip it over again, you're missing one bone. You've got eight of them in the, in the wrist, but you're only seeing seven from this perspective. So just a quick review, you have the clavicle that attaches to the sternum, attaches to the scapula, which is the shoulder blade. The shoulder blade holds the humerus into place. The shoulder blade is free floating, by the way, across the ribs. The only thing, the only bony connection your arm has with the center of your body is right here where the clavicle attaches to the sternum. Everything's floating, just suspended by muscles. And then the arm, the humerus, and then two in the forearm. Oops, where did they go? The two in the forearm, what were the two in the forearm? Yep, radius and ulna. And the radius is on the what side? Did you catch it? Is it on the lateral or the medial side? Lateral. Yep, it's lateral. The radius sits on the side with the thumb. And I always remember that that's the side that rotates easiest. If I want, I can put my thumb really easy because the radius has that perfect side. The ulna doesn't. The ulna helps me bring my bones this way, the elbow joint, but I can't can't rotate my hand over it easily. So the only thing in here on the medial side that's by the pinky and the radius on the side with the thumb. So the lower region going straight for the legs. First the called the pelvic girdle. So just like you have up here the scapula, there's a special little fossa where the humor pops into place and the hip. <coughs> You have a very large fossa, a very large dip, where the femur. You have the acetabulum. <coughs> Instead of the glenoid fossa, you have the acetabulum down here where the femur pops into place. So you can pivot the hip. One of the nice things about these joints is they give a lot of flexibility and a lot of rotation, but one thing you have to remember is the more rotation or flexibility you have in a joint, it's weaker. So where do you usually hear about things being dislocated? 
So the acetabulum, you need to remember, it's the equivalent of the glenoid floss in the, in the arm. And if it helps, if this is not the acetabulum because the acetabulum sits more close to your acetabulum. Right? If you look at the structure though, which one do you think is going to be more stable? The arm that has that little tiny fossa or the acetabulum that has a huge groove? Yeah, the acetabulum is going to be a lot more supportive. As we get older, though, some of the structures loosen up, the joints, the ligaments, they start getting looser and then higher risk because of all that weight. Okay, so the pelvic girdle. Here you had the pectoral girdle that was the shoulder. Pectoral girdle is referring to the hip and the bones that articulate with it. So here's one half of the hip, here's the other half. There are actually three bones in each half of the hip that you have to know. And the first one, the wide, broad one, all the way across here is called the ilium. So as you were developing in utero, they all three fused together, but this is the ilium. So when you're looking at something like the iliac crest, the crest is a sharp area that goes all the way across the top, and you can actually feel this on your hip, the iliac crest. You can see there's the iliac all the way across the top, there's the crest. At the very front part, when you bring your finger all the way to the front, where it starts to change, it's called the anterior spine, or anterior iliac spine. And then the big groove on the inside is a fossa. It's a basin like structure. And it's just like it's cupping your internal organs. So that's the ilium. If you go forward, this picture up here doesn't do justice for three dimensions, but as you start bringing your hand forward, you can see it projects out. This is the pubic bone. And the two sides will come together for the two pubic bones to meet. And there's a little tiny piece of cartilage through here. I guess I should say tiny. It's a small piece of cartilage that joins them together. It's called the pubic synthesis. They always put these little clear cartilage areas where there's hyaline cartilage. And the pubic symphysis is that. It's where these two things join together at the pubic bone. Pubic symphysis. <coughs> and there's a big gap at the back right now because the vertebra, the sacrum of the vertebra, should normally sit there. But there's the sacrum. in here. Okay. Pubic bone sits to the front, and the ischium sits to the back. And again, with the three dimensions, it doesn't really give you good perspective, but if you fell down right on your butt and you landed and you felt like you hit your bone in your butt, that's the ischium. It's the butt bone. Not if you hit your tailbone, that's different. But three dimensions again. Here you have the ilium pubic bone on the front with the pubic symphysis that connects it, and then the ischium <coughs> the back parts. And then we already talked about this, but the ilium, the large flaring bone. So if you <coughs> color code and divide it, all of this up here is all which one? Ilium, ischium, or pubic bone? that whole tan colored area up here. It's the ilium. And this broad wing is called the ala. It's, it's the broad wing. There's the acetabulum, which is the dip coming in. Here's the pubic bone. There's where the pubic symphysis would sit. And then the ischium, the back part. When you look at the pelvis, you can divide it into the true pelvis and the false pelvis. 
So if you look sideways across like this, you have a pelvic region that protects the internal organs. That's the false pelvis up here. It's almost like a broad wing. Lower down, well I shouldn't say all internal organs. Lower down, like where your bladder is going to be, that's where the true pelvis is at. Because it's completely enclosed by bone. Up here, not so much. But remember, you also have the sacrum sitting at the back, protecting everything back here. So all this lower region is called the true pelvis. And when you look at males versus females, the openings in the women are going to be larger because of what? Birth. So when you look at it, another thing is to look at the tailbone. So here you have the sacrum and the coccyx <coughs> the tailbone. In a woman, there's a large, broad area through here so the baby's head can come down along and slice straight out. With a man, you can see it hooks in more. So if a baby were to slide through there, it would get scraped and beat up really bad. There's nowhere for it to go anyway. I don't know why it's going anywhere. But when you look at the back from the side view, you can see that there's a lot more opening or a wider area for a female where it's more enclosed or curves in for a male. So how about this guy? Or girl, I guess you should say. What would you predict, male or female? Yeah. yeah. Look at the tailbone. It's curving in so, so harshly that it's actually hitting that post. And then looking from above or below, you can see a difference too. So there's the male. You can see how hard that curves in, the tailbone, the coccyx curves in. And to me, it almost looks like it's heart-shaped because it pokes in so far, it actually gives that bold appearance. And with a woman, you can see it's more broad and it's more round. Of course, for feeding that watermelon through there. So that's the hip. We get the femur, we just connect to the lower leg. Right. So the terms, when we refer to the leg, by the way, this you have to remember, the leg is from the knee to the ankle. It's not up here. This is not part of your leg in, in medical terms. This is called your thigh. So your thigh region or your femoral region is all through here. The leg is from the knee all the way out of the ankle. So the only bone that's in the thigh is the femur, just like the only bone that was in the arm is the humerus. Just like the arm is the longest and strongest of the bones. And then just like the arm, it has a head. So it starts at the head. The head of the humerus popped into the glenoid fossa. The head of the femur pops into the what? Acetabulum. Yep. So it pops into the acetabulum. Put down. Pops into the acetabulum. Just below the head, you have a what? A neck. I mentioned this before, but you don't have a little tiny tubercle, you don't have a tuberosity, you have a gigantic thing called a trochanter, and you only have trochanter on the femur. It's this big, bold structure that projects off. And your hip, you can feel it, like I said, if you put your finger at the side, and you pivot or rotate your hip, you can feel that thing in there moving around, and it's the trochanter. So you have the greater region that sits towards the top, you have the less region down at the bottom, and then in between you have a line, the intertrochanteric line. It says it's going between the two trochanters. If you get a hold of it and you kind of close your eyes and you feel it, you can feel there's a blade that goes all the way down it. And it's called the linea aspera. And it's a connecting point for muscles all the way along there. And then at the opposite end, you have these rounded structures called condyles. And just above it, you have epicondyles. Same thing, attachment points. The condyles for pivoting and rotating, and then the epicondyles above it. If you're looking at the back side, in between the condyles, they refer to it as actually the intercondylar fossa, the groove in between the condyles. Up here, you have something called the patellar surface because why? What do you think is going to sit there? The patella, yeah, the little tiny bone in the knee that helps align things. So not a lot of structures to remember there. 
the epicondyles, the condyles, the teller surface, and the um, intercondylar fossa. But it, the patel itself is a sesamoid bone because it looks like a sesame seed. And it just sits right there in that groove and it helps guide the motion. And I guess I will see you Monday. The whole school is closed on Friday. Yeah. Merry Christmas to you. Wait, are we coming to you tomorrow? Huh? No, he's going to come. No, I have a time. I have a conference I have to be at tomorrow, so don't show. Darn. Uh, sucks to be you. Yeah, it's an hour, hour drive you get saved. That's an extra hour of sleep. When you're fighting off a sinus infection and bronchitis. Yeah, we definitely.